Well, how is everybody doing today? It's been a great, great event, a great program here at Interdrone. I am a farmer. I am also the VP of Agriculture for Measure Drone as a Service. So I thought this would be appropriate, the perception of agriculture. Well, I've got one knock against me. I come from a small town, 369 people. Not only that, it's in Idaho. No, we are not in the Midwest, and our major crops are not corn and soybeans. And this is the perception we have a lot of times in America of what farmers are. Farmers only has not done good favors to us. <laughs> Great commercials. Nicole Ritchie and Paris Hilton, I don't think that was reality. And I did love hee-haw as a kid. In pop culture, everyone wants to be a farmer. Farming games are everywhere. And you see, they're dressed up in overalls. The movie Secondhand Lions and other movies, they always show an old truck or an old tractor. The Geico commercial on free range chickens has an old tractor in the background. And one of my favorites is the Settlers. No, we do not have a family lolly we all take a, lick, take a lick off of. But in Idaho, the perception is completely different from reality. Idaho National Laboratory. We have Micron, founded by agriculture dollars. We have the first cloned mule, Idaho Gem. Xcraft, which has a booth here, is two hours north of me. Idaho had the first city in the world powered by nuclear energy, and that was in Arco. We have more millionaires per capita than any state, and Idaho holds more patents per capita than any state. But here's the timeline on, we, on agriculture. So we learned how to cook with fire about two million years ago, and if you look clear to the far right, Here's where we're at in the last couple hundred years. Not very much progression. So in that 200 years, take a look at what's happened. An explosion of technology, the Industrial Revolution, John Deere's plow, McCormick's reaper, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, transformative technologies that changed the face of agriculture. We had Norman Borlaug in the 50s, with the Green Revolution doing hybridization to help us grow crops better. And on my farm, in five generations, we've gone from using horses and tractors to other equipment. My boys have grown up around this technology. We have tractors that drive themselves. The picture on the bottom right was me in the 1970s, and dang, I hated bell bottoms. And we wear many hats in agriculture. But the reality is, with a farmer, you're dealing with the CEO of a multi-million dollar corporation or business that operates internationally. And some of the hats they wear, banker, they're an agronomist, soil scientist, an accountant. Okay, yeah, we muck out barns too. But they always find a way to adapt and overcome on issues and problems. One of those, when I first started using precision ag and doing precision ag in 2003, started out with a PDA, then I progressed to this, but holding that PDA and the GPS receiver, plus having to run a stylus, didn't work. So I took this hat, riveted tin on, to hold the magnetic GPS receiver so I'm hands-free. That's technology evolution. <laughs> 70 years ago, my grandfather, 
It's trying to figure out how can we better our soils? How can we better our crops? This was his soil testing kit from the 50s. I still have it. I'm following in his footsteps until still trying to answer that question. How can we better our soils and better our production? In my lifetime, combine evolution, we went from a 12-foot header on the top left picture to the latest combine being 40 feet wide. 40 feet. You go from 50 bushel bulk tanks to 400 bushel bulk tanks. You go from no air conditioning to all the bells and whistles. And if we take a look back at tractor history, in the mid 40s is when tractors started outnumbering horses on the farm. And if we take a look at tractor production, after World War II was the peak tractor production in 1951. And then there's a decline. After World War II, the government granted a lot of tracts of land to returning GIs, and they were able to farm in areas because of irrigation projects and grants in area and where we couldn't farm before. Horsepower has increased. I have tractors that are using 450 horsepower or better. And as you can see, the bigger the horsepower, the bigger the problem sometimes. But what is driving agriculture? We are in our infancy in precision agriculture technology. The first yield monitor was invented in 1992, a quarter century ago. And now we're just utilizing it and it's coming standard on combines. Yet only 5% of American farmers are using the information to make management decisions. So who is driving and what is driving technology? No one? Well, in some cases, yes, auto steer. Agriculture adopted the technology before the car industry did. But here's one of the drivers, manpower. And this is a trend that is continuing. More people are leaving rural America and heading into cities. And if you look, take a look on the right-hand side, that trend is continuing, and you take a look at the green, it's even worse for farmers. Last year, Forbes came out with a study in their magazine of the top 10 endangered jobs. Agriculture farming was number two. They were looking at almost a 20% attrition rate of farmers getting out of the business in 2015. The average age of a farmer is 59 years old. And it's the same age of the people in the supporting industries agronomists, salesmen, mechanics. How are we going to replace that skilled labor and all of that knowledge? And if we take a look at global agriculture, it's not all farmland around the world or pasture land. And it's shrinking. Urbanization is taking away some of our best farmland. How are we going to feed a lot of people by the year 2050. Nine and a half billion people. Tremendous challenge agriculture has of meeting that demand along with doing it without use, with using fewer inputs and being environmentally sustainable. We can't do it alone. It's going to take technology. It's going to be looking outside of the agriculture industry to help us solve our problems, to help us overcome these obstacles. Biotech, auto steer, UAVs, any and all technology. And the other pressure we have on the growing population, their income globally is increasing too. When they moved from lower class to middle class, they went better grains and more and better protein. Their diets shift. 
We have to keep up with that demand. And because of that, agriculture does go mainstream. But you still see the coveralls and the pitchfork, American Gothic. It is a true challenge, and technology will help us feed a hungry world. I started using, yes, I confess, I started using in 2006 and proud of it. I love my drones. Built my own, crashed my own, and that's one thing I know in life. If you own a UAV, you're going to crash it. My boys have been on that journey with me. The picture was taken in 2007. The oldest one is now a junior at the University of Idaho studying, studying precision agriculture. The youngest is a senior in high school. They have watched this industry grow. They have partaken in the drone industry as well. When I saw an ad in an agriculture publication in 2006, I did not imagine the journey it was going to take me on. What a ride. I didn't realize the power that UAVs, UAS, or drones, I've, I've quit being a purist, have not only for agriculture but for other industries. But it wasn't until 2013 when Jeff Bezos of Amazon did his 60 Minutes interview. That got the ball rolling. But now we have part 107, taking pictures and video. Our next challenge in agriculture, aerial application. I cannot wait to get my hands on an aerial applicating UAV. We have a great partnership with DJI and looking forward to working with the Agris platform. I want to see what it can do. Are we going to be spraying whole fields with it? No. When you have a 2.6 gallon payload and a one gallon tip, let's say, and an acre is a football field without the end zones, you're only spraying two and a half of those. But there are applications we can use aerial application with drones in. What is on the horizon? Small drones to do pollination. Robotics to replace that manual labor to pick produce. Huh. Robots to pull weeds. I hope they make one to pick rocks too. Matter of fact, pro drone out there, those nice little grapples, I was thinking, hey, that looks like off of a skitter for logging. You can take that out in the woods, pick up logs, and set it on the deck of a truck. I would love to have had that for those dummy blocks, we call those little, round, or little square bales, to put it clear up about five uh, levels high instead of throwing it. But can we use that technology to pull weeds? North of me as well is a company called Farb Guidance. They're getting ready to announce their autonomous tractor. Their vision is like custom harvesters going through the Midwest is having autonomous tractors going around to different farms and doing the field work. This is how we will work and replace that labor crunch we have. In Australia, they're using face recognition on animals. Okay, why? Well, I, I got a lot of friends down, down under, so. Um, but dingoes are a problem. And they're using face recognition technology to see if it's the same dingo coming in and out causing the problems. What else can we utilize this in? How about laser weeding? Harper Adams University in the UK, they have a big track system set up in a uh, contained environment. What can we do with lasers on UAVs? 
Oh. I've had a lot of people want to come onto my farm to shoot the elk that cause problems. And they've tried to figure out a way to put a rifle on that to get them. But, but lasers, think about that. We use them to burn off cancer. Why can't we do that on leaves of plant for diseases? Or burn weeds out? Or zap insects? Late 80s, early 90s, a company called DuPont came out with a product called Harmony. Little box, open it up, and inside was this little robot on a string, moved it, goes forward, turns a little bit, forward, turn. That's how you got it to move. You open the flap, and it goes, this is the future of agriculture, and there's this robot on tracks pulling weeds up and munching it. We're here today. The other one they sent out, we got two of them. The other one had a vacuum, key, keyboard vacuum on it. Showed this UFO looking octopus machine out there, all these arms sucking up the weeds. You think ProDrone could pull those up? But we can't say we've always done it this way. And that is something the agriculture industry has to overcome. And it's a hard one. This book was my grandfather's from the 1930s, a USDA publication. How to work your horses more profitably. Well, not very many horse farmers left. But if you think about it, a farmer has only about 40 chances in his lifetime to get the perfect crop on one acre. I raise multiple crops in a three-year rotation. So that 40 chances got cut into a third. And if I focus just on winter wheat, do I do soft white or hard red? Now that third got cut in half. And then if I change varieties, that gets cut in half again. The odds aren't very good for me getting the perfect crop. And that's why agriculture, it's hard to change. We have to understand that in business. We have to listen to those in agriculture on what their needs are. What technology do you need instead of, here's the technology and we're going to shove it down your throat. That is not going to work. We have to understand our customers. We have to be sustainable and efficient at the same time. Great technology, this was in Brazil. And those of you OCD, there's 32 combines there. This is efficiency. But think about it. 32 people in a combine, I think there's like 12 tractors. What if they were all autonomous? So with that, uh, we're going to do questions after, um, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.